Is is Braun going to be on remotely? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, Ken says he thinks Braun's still traveling. Okay. Okay, so... Well, it's uh, it's the bottom of the hour. Shall we start? Yeah, so I, I, I think you are the one that can open slides or... I, I am not. I am, I'm just, I'm still listed as a participant, not okay. as a chair. So you're the, you're going to have to run the slides or I can, I can run them. I can request slides here. Okay, so I just then... requested sharing slides and you can uh, approve that. Okay. So um, All right. I, I click, I and grant you the slides. Okay. Share slides. All right. So here we go. All okay. right, well, I'll give the quick intro. Welcome to the CalExt meeting at IETF 117. I am the person in the front of the room, and we have a chair online whose face you see over there on the screen that is preventing you from scanning the uh, QR code that you need to scan to get in. So we have this thing that Ken will give you if you need it, which has the QR code to scan, to sign the blue sheet and tell us that you're here so that we get a bigger room next time for the crowd that we have. Daniel, <laughs> head for chairing, go for it. Thank you. So this is a calendaring extension uh, session. Um, next slide. I mean, unless you have never seen the note well, it's time to read it. Probably next slide. And because not well was not enough, we um, there is a note really well that uh, basically you have to behave properly. Next slide. Um, yeah, so maybe that's a uh, give, given the number of people we are. Um, if you have to say something, uh, I basically yeah. think that you you can jump to the mic. Uh, I think that's pretty fair. Yeah. <laughs> Next slide. So the agenda. So this is where we are. Um, we do have some uh, GS contact um, drafts that are in the RFC editor queue, but are, uh, that keeps on being updated. So uh, Robert is going to have a presentation on that. Um, and um, we will probably discuss um, um, some of the question I received from um, from the from our AD, which is the security area AD um, doing that job. Um, but let's have that discussion later. There are two drafts that are in working group last call, um, but I think for over six months. So uh, one of those has the shepherd uh, being written up. The other one. I think does not have it yet. So um, um, I was wondering um, if anyone present knows where those drafts are, what the status, are they ready to be sent to the ISG or are, are we waiting for something? Um, Hi, Daniel, this is Ken. Um, I don't actually have an answer for you, but I'm standing up to let you know that Mike had anticipated being here today, but I received a text earlier that said something came up and he wasn't able to. Um, oh, okay. He did let me. He did let me know that all the drafts that he's currently working on have not been updated since 116. So there's not much uh, to add to certainly the expired drafts. And my guess is if the if the other two have been in last call for six months. They probably just need a refresh, and maybe we can move on with them. Yeah, that's what I think too, because one of those is um, is addressing some comments received from the shepherd Brown. So, um, but yeah, I hope everything is fine with Mike, and uh, we'll probably clarify that when he is back. Um, but I, I I I agree with you that I think they they should be close to be shipped. Uh, then we have a full branch of expired draft. 
so um, I, I, I think, um, um, yeah, now there is a battle between those. Uh, I think Robert is in charge and those Mike is in charge. But um, um, Robert, can you state a little bit uh, how you expect the, the draft you you are handling to? Hey, this is Robert speaking. Um, so the the ones in the first bullet of the expired are the ones I'm I've been working on. Um, also with Mike, actually, um, we are we let them expire because we basically have no bandwidth to work on them. Uh, for me, that's mainly because of the JS contact work, and I don't think I'll be able to work on them until JS contact is published. Okay, right. So, but um, um, I mean, as soon as JS contact is um, is published, uh, you will be working on those. How long do you expect that work to to take? Uh, is that a six months or a multi years? I so first of all, I'm not sure if I will be able to immediately start working on them. Um, I can back to you on that uh, later. Um, in terms of why well, I think that that's going to take about a year. Um, okay. That also depends on uh, how many people are willing to join um, the interoperation tests that we want to do while writing the specs. Okay. So let me ask you, um, as a milestone, should we target July or November next year? November next year sounds okay. somewhat reasonable. reasonable. Yeah, there is no commitment, uh, though. It's uh, just yeah. for us to check. <laughs> um, does anyone have any idea about the other drafts or does want to say anything? Yeah, this is Ken. Um, just to, to add on to what Robert said about the, the JS calendar stuff, I, I know that um, CalConnect would like to do some interop testing before we publish another set of drafts that might have issues to avoid what uh, what happened with the first go around. So yeah, pushing it off to next November sounds reasonable to me. As far okay. as the other drafts there, um, I know Mike is still interested in series. I don't know. I think he has an implementation. I don't know if anybody else has expressed interest. Um, I'll, so I'll let Mike speak to that. As far as vPoll, I know there's interest within FastMail, uh, and we'd like to implement uh, that particular spec, uh, but there's just no timetable on when that might get done. But uh, I, I will certainly work with Mike to get that one refreshed um, and get it to the point where we can maybe do some uh, some, some testing. Server-side subscriptions, I think we were waiting to see if we get any kind of feedback from the Apple folks where this kind of started um, and to this point we haven't had have been able to find anybody that sh shows any interest in, in uh, joining the effort or at least informing our effort so that might uh, that might just stay expired for a while until it gets uh, picked back up and finally Calf scheduling controls I think that's bronze and I think he let it expire because it was no longer needed okay um, but we can. Uh, I'll I'll check with him once he uh, once he lands and um, he's available. Oh yeah, there is no hurry with that. Uh, also, so uh, and what about VPOL? VPOL is the one that uh, I said I, I will work with Mike to get that refresh because there's definitely some interest okay. in fast mail to use that uh, down the road. Okay, so VPOL and and so um, okay and series is the one you don't do you don't know uh, it it's only Mike. Yeah, series. Th this okay. is this is Mike's baby. I think he's <laughs> using it within uh, his own product, but I don't know if anybody else has shown any interest. So I don't know okay. what the urgency is to to move that forward. Well, but if, if okay. Mike wants to carry the torch, if Mike wants to carry the torch on that, then he's welcome to speak up on the list. Okay, right. Uh, I, I will check with him, but I, I do see that the next, um, I mean, other than the cal, um, calendar, um, GS calendar draft, uh, VPool and series will be the, ne the next one we, we will address. That sounds correct. 
Okay. So let me interrupt here because a bunch of people just came in the room. Yeah. Uh, because Daniel's on the screen, the code you need to scan is not on the screen, but there's this blue thing over here that you can scan. Please do it so that we get a bigger room next time and it's not so crowded. Or you could, any way you, any way you log into Meet Echo will work. So, um, Kent, just to make it, um, um, is July, next July fine for VPOL? That sounds reasonable. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, so for the folks that just joined the session, I'm just wondering if they want to say something about any of the current work or if we move directly to um, Robert's presentation on GS Contact. Yeah, so, I think uh, we just go on. Yeah. Yeah. I suspect, Robert, you can take the floor. Hello. Um, I'm not sure, should I present these slides or is someone presenting them for me? I haven't, I don't know. If you do maybe. them, then you can control them uh, or I'm happy to do them and control them from here. But uh, probably easier if you just request You could, please, I haven't, I haven't um, done that before, so. Um, well, give it a try. The, um, on, uh, the second icon, the, the. Ah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Oh, I have to grant it to you. <laughs> that's. Oh, okay. And now I see. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Share. Oh, great. Uh, can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So um, I'm going to talk about the um, JS contact um, drafts that Mario and I are working on. Um, so we uh, we had ended working group last call in December last year. Um, and we started ITF last call uh, then in January. Um, as you can see in the first four or so years of uh, writing the drafts, um, uh, in comparison to what happened since uh, we started ITF last call, you might uh, realize that there's been a lot of churn on the specification since then. Uh, we received extensive feedback during ITF last call, and I think that feedback made specs much for the better. Um, that being said, we now consider the specs um, complete, um, and uh, we, yeah, we're basically happy with uh, how it turned out. I'm going to to discuss a couple of changes that we did. Um, so for JS contact. The overall message here is that in terms of the data model, not really that much has changed. Um, the majority of changes that we did in this specification was um, in the um, in clarifying a lot of the stuff that we that in the in the um, previous versions was implicitly assumed. Um, and, I, and I guess during the working group last call that didn't um, show up to be much of an issue because many people there were already like thinking in terms of the JS calendar work. So a lot of them was for, for them already was like um, implicit, um, but we hit a lot, we, we got a lot of re, uh, feedback um, for ITF last call from people who obviously were not, uh, uh, did not really look at JS calendar before. And so didn't know much of the terminology and, and idioms we were, um, reusing from there. That being said, uh, we did a couple of changes in JS contact, um, mainly around names and addresses. Uh, for names, we now aligned the name data model with um, what the Unicode, uh, what Unicode is doing for person name formatting. Um, for uh, ad addresses, we, uh, we added um, quite a lot of new address components uh, to better support international addresses. Um, uh, especially from um, for Japanese, um, uh, but also other Asian languages, uh, we got requests for uh, supporting uh, pronunciation. I will uh, present later in uh, later today um, how we did that. Um, 
We um, repeatedly got the feedback that the um, data format is quite verbose, and uh, we try to um, to narrow that down. Um, mainly, for example, by uh, removing some kind of some some metadata that is uh, almost always implicit in the data model anyway. Um, one of the la last changes we had to do, um, which um, we only considered after we ran out of all other options, um, uh, we had to uh, change the semantics of the patch object uh, for GS contact. I will later also show why is that. Um, and as I said already, um, most of the were, uh, updates in this specification were actually examples and clarifications. Um, on the other hand, the JS contact V card uh, document, which is the one which is defines how to convert between the JS contact format and V card format. Um, this got a lot of um, uh, new stuff added um, because now we fully cover all IANA registered V card elements. Um, and we are actually registering um, quite a bunch of new ones. I get to that on the next slide. Um, we added um, a lot of examples um, for implementers to um, to clearly see uh, where we are getting at uh, with these conversion rules. Uh, we also had to um, we'll also we we'll also need to register a few um, a few properties both for JS contact and V card that really are only useful for conversions. So we put them in this document because we don't expect them to be useful outside of the context of converting between these two formats. Um, the vCard JS content extensions document is the third and last one. Um, and this uh, document is the one where we define for vCard, um, where we define new stuff for vCard that we need to convert between JS contact and vCard. Um, uh, since the working group, the Calix working group charter um, requires um, any new extension to define um, uh, features in both formats, either being iCalendar and JS Calendar, or in this case, JS Contact and vCard, um, we defined a couple of new properties and parameters for vCard. Um, we also had to, um, we were also going to update uh, the existing address and name properties for vCard. I'll also present more on that soon. Um, but looking at this document from another perspective, perspective means this is the stuff that, that, that we added to the context data model by defining JS contact. Um, so that's all the stuff that vCard didn't cover already. Um, so getting to pronunciation, um, I can imagine that might not be that easy to read for you. Um, but basically, there was already um, coming out from CalConnect an, an ITF draft um, in a single zero version in 2018 that um, um, was started as an attempt to um, to define for vCard how to uh, how to add phonetics, especially for names, um, uh, to vCard, we picked um, that up, um, changed it a little bit for what we also needed for JS Contact, and now on the on the on the left side on the, in, in the, for the vCard you see uh, how we would um, how this would be represented by our proposal in vCard, and um, likewise you see how it's. Um, how it's encoded in JS contact. Um, here you, um, as, a, as, a, as a side effect, you also see why we needed to allow patching uh, existing array members in JS contact, because otherwise uh, the, um, uh, the, the patch object that we're using in the localizations document would just like blow up and, um, uh, and, and add unnecessarily, unnecessary redundancy in redefining the name components that we are actually not wanting to change. Um, 
on the next slide, I'm, so here um, I'm going to talk about what we added to the existing vCard address uh, property. Uh, the first bullet lists the ones that uh, the original vCard version 4 RFC defines. Um, the next bullet lists um, what we added. Um, here you can see that where, where um, vCard 4 defined a single component street address, which included a lot um, of stuff, especially since the extended address and post office box already were deprecated in, um, in RFC 6350. Um, we basically split what, what typically went into street address into a lot of new components so that it's more clear um, what is what in, in this in the string. Um, uh, and while doing so, we added, as I said, a lot of stuff that's mainly interesting for, uh, let's say, non-Western non addresses. Um, when we did that, we, we extended the so we, we kind of extended the property value of the address property. We tested it with a couple of implementations, um, uh, some of them being the um, Google People API and also the, or, or the product actually, and um, the Apple clients um, and a couple of other implementations. And um, it turned out that all implementations we tried, we sent them our new values, just basically ignored everything they didn't know didn't know. So that's um, a good sign for us that we can go ahead with that, we think. Um, and uh, for we also define a rule how to um, encode these extended uh, address values also in a backwards compatible way in the street address. Um, the same thing we are doing for the uh, vCard names where we didn't have to add that much. We only needed to add the new component for a secondary surname, which is like a very, like a very different, like a different thing than a surname. And vCard didn't allow for that uh, so far. And we are also splitting um, generations like junior or the third um, from where they typically went into the honorific suffixes because the, it's, it's not really the same. Um, and Doing so allows us to, um, uh, again, align the name vCard model with the Unicode person name model. And with that, implementations will be able to use um, a, a lot of, a, a couple of very sophisticated Unicode uh, algorithms for formatting person names. Um, similarly, like, like we did for address, we tested this again. Um, we didn't see any client fail. They just ignored what they didn't understand. Um, and again, we define a, a rule how to um, uh, how to encode names uh, also in a format that these clients can can see all the values of the name. Um, so with all these vCard changes, we are thinking of we should, if we should define a new vCard version. Um, I'm not sure if we will come to a conclusion in this meeting. Um, uh, otherwise, we might get uh, asked that on the mailing list. Um, there are a couple of reasons um, for doing so and for not doing it. Um, and I, I, I couldn't tell at the moment. Um, I, I kind of would tend to say we bumped the version, but um, I would like to hear more from other implementers uh, on, on their opinion. Um, and um, as I said before, we consider this complete. Um, we are currently doing interoperation tests. Um, and then when we've like, when we have successfully completed that stage, we are, we would like to uh, finish last call. That's the end of my presentation. So I just have one question. You mentioned that you created some properties um, only for the purpose of conversion. Correct. I'm wondering if those properties, so those property never happens to be found in any any file. Well, yeah, they, they will be found. Like we will register them at IANA. Um, okay. 
but we um, like, so we have this document and we will register them at IANA, um, but we are not putting it in this document because this document we think adds, adds new elements to vCard that might even be useful for implementers should they not ever implement JS contact, but still get an extended data model for vCard. But these conversion properties, they are really just um, the binding glue when, when someone wants to convert. So we don't put them in the same specification. So, okay. So just for me to understand, if I give you a GS contact, you transform it into a vCard contact, will I have those properties or no? Well, yeah, it, it can be, it depends on the, it depends on, on the contents of your, of your card, but they can, yeah. can show up, but they are, they are defined in a way that every standards compliant vCard client will see them, but not know what to do with them and just ignore them basically. Okay. Right. So it's like, um, it's very internal. Yeah. So, and then, yeah. Okay. Okay. So then. Okay, then it's from that V card, sp specific V card, you can go back to the GS contact. Correct. Okay, right. Uh, is that one of the things that justify um, a new version or? No, I think these these are are not that interesting. But um, the, the the ones that might um, warrant a new version are changing the value types of addresses mm -hmm. and names because that's something we change yeah we change something existing here and uh addresses and names are like i mean they are the core of the context <laughs> data model that's yeah okay right so um what I, I, I'd like, so you, you have to finish some interrupt tests. Um, I mean, to finish the, the working group last call. To my view, the changes are not, I mean, we, we had from the ISG, so Raman, I'm just saying um, the AD, he told me that um, the ISG was wondering whether we should put those documents back in the working group or no. Um, my position is to say that the changes are not, um, I mean, I, I don't want to say they are minimal, but um, I would say from an ISG perspective, they will probably not see the difference between the document uh, that, are, that have been accepted and the current version. So this is why... I would more, more in favor that we have a strong review within the working group, but we don't bring back the document in the working group. Um, so simply put, I don't think that's going to be useful that the ISG review a second time those documents. That's it. I don't know what the ISG is willing to do. Um, but um, what in any case, I think it's very useful now that some people from the working group start reviewing those documents um, or um, so my question to you Robert is um, do you think we should wait a little bit before asking people to review or are the document ready for review no the sooner the better okay we we, we don't we have no changes planned except for like um, the version yeah we have now no changes for in the contents plan. I mean, we, we, yeah. sometimes we see there is a typo or whatever. So we are yeah, updating yeah. the specs, but not, um, we're not changing really something okay. interesting. So my question to the audience remote and on site is, um, uh, who could commit to preview, um, um, I mean, those drafts, there are three drafts. Um, they are pretty easy to review. Um, so I'm wondering if um, if some people could commit to to review that um, during this month or during the two next weeks, um, that would be really appreciated. So any volunteer? Uh, Daniel, this is Ken. Um, since I'm yeah. actively implementing this and I'm reading these things on an hourly basis, I will commit to reviewing them. Okay, thank you, Ken. 
do we have anyone from Apple? Danielle, Philip? Wrong team. No, no other volunteers? Well, I, I will ask also some volunteers on the mailing list, so maybe the audience is a little bit broader. Um, but yeah, we we I'd like those reviews to be done, let's say, by the end of August, so that we could basically tell the RFC editor and the IHG they're ready to be edit published. That's what I am aiming to. But then I don't control all the bits. <laughs> so thank you, Robert. Um, I think Neil is in the queue. Oh, okay, Neil. I, I, I for some reason. I, yeah, I didn't actually have any questions. I just wanted to say a really big thank you to Robert and Mario because it's been a monumental effort uh, with this last call feedback, and you've done amazing work. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, this is Ken. I was actually going to say the same thing that Neil just did, but he did it for me. A um, couple other issues. Um, Dan, you said that you, you were not going to ask the IASG to, to re-review these. Did I hear that correctly? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that the, the, what the review is probably enough. Okay. So, which means Maybe the I'm document misunderstand. is it. Maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're saying, but uh, Robert can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of the changes for non-Westernized names and addresses were a result of feedback from the IESG. And if that's the case, I think those reviewers probably want to look at the new text. Yeah, that that's sense? correct. Yeah. Okay, so uh, because I... Um, okay, I, I had in mind that uh, those comments were coming from... Um, uh, reviewers outside the ISG, but yeah, yeah. So Robert, if you if you have the names, I, I think we should contact definitely the people that provided some reviews to confirm that uh, it's fine with them. Um, I actually missed that some of those reviewers were from the ISG, but um, I would say I would like to avoid a formal review by the ISG, hmm. but I yeah. would like as much as we can some reviewers to uh, review the documents. Yeah, I, I know who to contact for the international stuff. Um, and okay. um, looking at the data tracker, there's, there's, um, I think there's one issue marked um, for for this document for the JS contact document, um, and I think that's from Roman, um, but that's yeah. uh, very likely to be a, of, because of an outdated version. Um, but we like we let it in there because we didn't want to uh, publish them too early. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, so. So that's for him. It's pretty clear. Um, I, I I think we should now track the people that can actually review the documents, wherever they are from, and then once we we're pretty confident that the document is um, is fine, that we tell officially um, the ISG or the AD that it's fine. And um, my hope is that it, it remains um, um, in the RFC editor queue and they just publish it. But maybe they will be, they, they are, worst case, they are willing to put it back in the working group. Then we will say, yeah, we have all the reviews. And I mean, it's just the ISG redoing a ballot and uh, and um, and that dance, but um, if we can avoid that, that would be great. But it does it means we need to be to to have those reviews. Cool. Um, so I'm gonna stop the presentation. I would like um, talk about one more thing related to VCard, um, just shortly, please. Um, and that's a question because. Um, the RFC 6350, so the current VCOD version 4, um, they are defining for the address property a label parameter, which is like meant to like include a full address that you can put on a label if you send a package or whatever. 
uh, but we realized that parameter is not registered at Diana. Um, mm. So I don't know, like if we find an errata for 6350 for the Diana registry, will that trigger Diana to register that that parameter or do we, or should we rather add this parameter in our specification because Ayana will need to act on them anyway? So that question, I, I, I'd like to maybe ask Barry what he thinks, but um, it's probably good that you add in the current spec, we are adding that, um, that label, label. Um, yeah, so and, but and we will not mention. redefine it. We will just add it to yeah. our template for IANA. Yeah. And maybe they will simply remove that and say, okay, we, we add it. I, I don't know what they do, but um, okay. But maybe yeah, Barry we, has another opinion. Yeah, I was going to ask Barry myself because I, I, my understanding is you, you can't file an errata against something that's not an IANA if it was never in the original text of the IRC to add it to IANA, correct? You can, you can file an errata report that says this should have registered something with IANA, but that doesn't get it registered. It only <laughs> alerts the reader right. to the omission. Is there anything preventing Robert from adding the registry to his extensions draft? No. Okay, so we do that. That, that sounds like the easier course at that point then. Perfect. All You're, right. Filing the errata is going to do nothing other than just make a notation, but it's, nothing's ever going to get done with it. Right. Okay, great. Yeah, this is... It, it would be a reader might sort of burp on it saying, what does this have to do with this document? But there's nothing procedurally that says you can't create an unrelated registry or, or create a registry that you're going to use that should have been created before you can create it now or something like that. I mean, any of that stuff is fine. Right. So when Robert does the registration, should he refer to 6350 as the document that yes. it appears in? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You, what, what I would do there is create the registry and say that the reference for the registry is the old document and this one or something like that. All right. We'll do that. Thank you. Uh, while, while I'm standing up here, this is still Ken. Um, on the discussion of whether we should bump the V card version from 4 to 4.1, Robert, I'm assuming the thought there is if we do bump it is because you've extended the address and name the number of components and not because of all the other extensions correct yes that's um that's our main idea like if we if we would bump the version we thought we would really trigger the client to like not expect the values to be at the backwards compatible places and like but yeah, I, I guess from my, our, sorry, for our, from our testing, um, we like realized that apparently clients are not looking at the version anyway, in most of the cases. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say. It doesn't appear any clients look at the current version, whether it's three or four. And because you've defined a way to make the values backwards compatible, if a client ignores the rest, I don't know that we necessarily need to bump the version, but I could be convinced otherwise. Yeah. Well, is that the normal behavior that they ignore the version, or um, I guess at some point they they should look at that version? So yeah. I mean, in context of V card, it's so regularly it's not normal, I would say, um, but in context of V card, it kind of is um, because it has gone through a couple of iterations. The whole mm. date form. Yeah, this is Ken again. From, from what little testing I've done, it seems like most clients assume everything's vCard version 3 anyways. Mm, okay. And if you, if you give it a, v, a version 4 card with the actual IANA registered properties to create a group, most UIs just show it as an individual contact and not a group. In order to create a group, you have to use the, the non-standard Apple properties that they came up with to get around the issue of most clients not using version four. So uh, I don't know what the solution is here. And does that prevent 
um, to finish the working group last call, or um, I, I, get, I suppose it's, yes, we need to fix that before declaring victory. I mean, if we decide to not bump the version, we okay. We, need, we don't need to do anything. So it's, I mean, it's it's very easily done. But um, I'm also inclined to say we're not going to change the version because if clients are not going to look at it anyway, it okay, doesn't make much sense. Yeah, I I don't think the version should hold up anything. Um, the, the specs are are clear. The conversion's clear. Whether anybody chooses to use version 4 or 4.1 that's out of scope for us right we've we've defined something that's clear use it or don't okay i see so okay right any other comments i see none so um yeah we need to to look at those preview and i think um that's our homework and um this session is probably over. So thank you everyone for attending that session. And thank you, Robert, for um, having all those uh, GS contact as they are now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, thank you Barry, for handling the group. <laughs> Anytime. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Yeah, they, yeah, it used to be for, for iOS and Mac.